explain to you that there are two exits in the event of a fire. Uh, there's one over here and one over here. As you can see, both of them have a sign above them of person running. And the best advice we can give you is if there's a fire alarm, run through either of those two exits. Very good. Um, it's great that we've got Matt here with us this evening. The first thing I'd like to say about Matt is that uh, Matt was one of the early founders of the Centre for Life, which has now been going for over 15 years. And it's acquired quite a, a reputation, particularly in the medical field, uh, in fertility, uh, in, in treating muscular diseases, in treating genetic diseases. It's been a big hit, I think, in, in the Northeast. And it's got a reputation now nationally and internationally. And a lot of that is due to the early help that Matt gave to get the project off the ground. Uh, but there's another reason, I think, why we want to welcome Matt here, I think, tonight. And that is he's first and foremost a Northumbrian. And I'm proud to say in that respect, he's one of us and I think probably every other person in the room. And therefore, it's a great honor for us to have him here this evening to speak to us about his latest book on the evolution of everything. Matt's enterprise uh, is bold, if it's anything. He aims to answer uh, the very simple question, which is, how is change brought about? And the answer is, the human world's not the result of any kind of design or anybody who decides to, to, to work this out from above, but it's more simply the consequence of all human action, and human development in this regard is no different from any other form of evolution that's to be found in the natural world. And Matt points to a long history of others who've held this view, although it hasn't necessarily been a prominent one, uh, from classical and enlightenment times who've put forward very much the same argument as himself. But it's contrary to the way that most of us have actually been taught. History particularly um, allows us to think in terms of change being brought in terms of top-down direction uh, from leaders of one kind, from kings, from Napoleons, from emperors, whereas in fact it may be coming from a totally different direction. Matt argues that this is in fact a misunderstanding of the way the world works and where top-down command has seized the reins, it's often proved to be inefficient, smothering on an occasion to be tyrannical. But it may be that the environment is changing and the advent of the internet uh, is altering how we perceive ideas and the influence that they can have in a very much bottom-up way. So spontaneous organic change, as Matt terms it, the forces of evolution can outwit what he also calls the authoritarian twitch. It's fair to say that this book has stirred up several hornets' nests. So we look forward to what Matt has to say to us. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Alistair, very much indeed for that, that kind introduction. Uh, and I would, you know, I would just like to stress that the, the people who really made this place the huge success it is are uh, particularly Alistair and Linda, under whose leadership it has been uh, an extraordinary uh, story. Um, and in that sense, it's top down what happened here, but only in that sense, because I would argue that it is consistent with my theory because this place has evolved in the 15 years it's been going. It, is, um, it has changed, it has uh, continually improved and changed in, in, in unexpected and interesting ways. And I congratulate them on everything that's being done at the Centre for Life uh, and uh, all that, that, that happens in this wonderful village. Um, my role was extremely small, uh, and I would stress that. Um, now, uh, it, it's slightly intimidating for me to, to be here because I'm looking out on an audience which is full of the faces of friends. Um, uh, and uh, I've, you know, been giving, I've been going around the world giving talks about this book and uh, feeling secure in the knowledge that I'm talking to complete strangers and will never have to answer for what I say. But uh, clearly I can't get away with that in Newcastle. Um, uh, and when I said to my publishers, um, yeah, well, I want to launch the book in three places, New York, London, and Newcastle. Uh, they were uh, a bit, oh, why Newcastle? And I said, well, why not? You know, I'll get a big crowd there. And sure enough, I've got a big crowd. Thank you for coming. In my last book, The Rational Optimist, I chronicled the amazing improvements in human living standards over the last 50 years in particular, the last 200 years in general. The, the, the tripling of income in real terms, uh, the two-thirds reduction in, in infant mortality, uh, the 30% increase in human lifespan that we've seen in my lifetime alone. 
uh, and the fact that today people are healthier, happier, cleaner, cleverer, more, more peaceful, more equal than they have ever been. Um, because people in poor countries are getting rich past, faster than people in rich countries, etc. And I wrote that book in the middle of the Great Recession, and it was a little brave to say the world's going to go on getting better um, at that point, because it might not have done. There was a lot of bad news around. But in fact, we've seen extraordinary improvements, particularly for poor people in the world since then. Uh, the GDP per capita of Mozambique is 60% higher than it was in 2008, for example. We've not seen such improvements in living standards in the rich world. Um, which has meant that the world has become more equal at a much faster rate than usual. We're seeing incredible falls in uh, uh, malaria mortality at the moment, etc. So, so the story has gone on. But what was driving it? And what was driving it was clearly innovation. Clearly the big story of the last 200 years is innovation. Not just in technology, but in habits as well. Innovation in tools and in rules. And that innovation is coming from, well, what is it coming from? And that was the question I grappled with a little bit in that book, and I grapple with particularly in this book, uh, because it's not immediately obvious that, that we can ever cause innovation by, we can create innovation with a direct policy. We can sort of make the conditions right for it, um, but we have a terrible history of trying to achieve innovation by particularly setting off in certain directions. Uh, and uh, so, it emerges sort of unbidden from the interactions of ordinary individuals, it was the argument I make. And in particular, it comes about because of the combination and recombination of ideas. Every technology we possess is a combination of other technologies. I can't think of a single thing in my pocket or, or, or my, in my clothing or anything that isn't in some sense a combination of different skills that different people invented at different times and different places. And that's the great story of innovation, is the combining and recombining of ideas. And it occurred to me that this is, of course, exactly the same way that nature does innovation, because it combines and recombines DNA sequences. That's what evolution is. It's the, it's the combining and recombining of genes to produce new combinations of genes which then get selected. Uh, and so I wanted to set out and try and explore just how far it is true to say that human society evolves rather than is changed by people. And I think we can go a very, very long way down that route. There are all sorts of aspects of, of human society that actually show characteristic features of evolution. And in a sense, evolution has continued through the biological realm and into the technological one in a very seamless way uh, over the last few uh, decades and centuries. Darwinian evolution is one of the great ideas that's ever occurred to mankind. Uh, da uh, Daniel Dennett calls it... Uh, a universal acid. It eats every container you put it in. It's impossible to contain. It sort of spills wherever, wherever you go. It, it sheds light on things you don't even think, and it turns things upside down. So, for example, the whole, the whole idea um, of design has to be turned upside down by Darwin in evolution, because you can see the beautiful fit of form to function in a bird's wing or, or the eye of, of, of a human being, uh, and yet you can say, well, hang on, that could have come about without a designer. And the idea of design without a designer is such a, an extraordinary idea that it took centuries to sink in. It's still sinking in. And there are many parts of the world that are still, still very resistant to that idea with respect to, to uh, biological uh, things as well as to, uh, to, 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 to other aspects of life. Um, and um, one of the features, I think, that gives it away, that gives away an evolutionary system, uh, is that it leaves little traces behind. It leaves fossils of things that it, it took the wrong direction first and had to end up taking the right direction. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean um, living fossils, things like coelacanths, but also things that, that features of our, of our lives that, that you wouldn't design it that way if you were starting from scratch, like the fact that in the giraffe's neck, one of the, one of the blood vessels has to go all the way up and over a bone and back down again, um, because the neck wasn't that long to start with. Um, and that's a characteristic, that shows that it's evolved. You know, God wouldn't have done it that way, if you like. Um, there's a joke that rather illustrates this point, which is that there are four engineers in a bar arguing about God. And the first one says, God is a genetic engineer. 
because uh, if you look at the human genome, it's clearly built by a genetic engineer like me, and uh, therefore he must have been a genetic engineer because that's the fount of everything. And the second one says, no, you're wrong. God's a mechanical engineer. The skeleton was built by a mechanical engineer. It has to be. So he must be a mechanical engineer. He must be qualified in that subject. And the third one says, no, God's an electrical engineer. Look at the brain. It's clearly built by somebody with an uh, electrical engineering skill of really high quality, better even than me. And the fourth one says, you're all wrong. God is a civil engineer like me, because who else would put a waste disposal pipe through a recreational area? <laughs> so the, the argument I, I advance in this book is that, um, is that biological evolution is the special theory of evolution. Uh, uh, by analogy with Einstein, and that there is a general theory of evolution, that it happens in any system of information with recombination and selection, uh, such as human society. Um, I got this idea from Richard Webb, a, a, a friend who said, hang on, I think you're making a point a bit like Einstein, there's a special theory of evolution and a, and a general theory of evolution. And that evolution happens everywhere. It is, the word means unfolding. It means that the, originally meant that the, the, the emergence um, of complexity from simplicity, it, it has connotations of gradualness, it has connotations of incremental change, building upon things. Uh, it, it implies descent with modification that you can see the family trees of ideas. Uh, and there's a sort of inexorability about evolution that it can, uh, it, it, you can't speed it up, but you can't stop it either, that it sort of marches to its own, to its own tune. Um, and of course, also at the heart of evolution is the idea of trial and error, uh, that uh, you try lots of things and you select the ones that work. You don't set out with the perfect solution to the problem at the beginning. Uh, and you can see this very clearly in, in human technologies. Uh, the early history of the aeroplane, for example, is full of failed experiments, is full of you know, different designs for the tail plane or the number of wings or something. Uh, and, and that's often true of, of technologies today, is that the, in the early phases, you, you get a plethora of different ways of, of, of producing a technology, and then it kind of settles down to, to one design. And of course, the corollary of my point of my argument is that we're all creationists still, that we're all going around seeing design where we should actually see emergence, uh, that we're seeing, we're looking at human society and assume, assuming that someone's in charge when they, may not, when they might not be. It might be a phenomenon that has just pulled through, through the way ordinary people interact rather than through how some clever person told them how to, how to, how to behave. Um, uh, and, and that in that sense, we're, just in th we're still in thrall, like people were in Victorian times with respect to biological design. We're still in thrall to the idea uh, of intelligent design, or unintelligent design even. Now, this theory is, I have to admit, a little bit, theory is too grand a word, this, this theme is a little bit procrustean. That is to say, I am uh, trying to fit pretty well everything I see in the world uh, onto this theory, and occasionally, I have to admit, even in the book, I fail. Uh, and one or two reviewers have been kind enough to point this out to me. Um, um, but, you know, you've got to try, haven't you? And, uh, uh, you know, see if you can, can make it work. So let me give you just a few examples of things that have evolved without any policy driving them in human uh, history. Marriage. Marriage starts out as a uh, in, in hunter-gatherer societies, there's a very fluid arrangement. It then become, becomes, in early agricultural societies, something that's extremely polygamous, with powerful men having huge harems and unpowerful men having no wives at all. It then uh, gradually becomes monogamous in Western societies under certain economic conditions and with a, a little bit of a push from Christianity, or at least Christianity riding in on, on uh, uh, suggesting that people should be more monogamous. And today, it's kind of evolving away again, so that many people uh, now uh, are moving on towards something more like serial monogamy, or particularly in societies where uh, women have decided in perfectly rationally that they don't need a tiresome man around when they want to bring up a family if the state is going to step in and, and be uh, uh, there for them instead. So you can see marriage changing without really anybody saying, we insist that marriage is going to change this way. Um, music evolves. Clearly, you go from one genre to another and they, they, they cross-fertilize in a very biological way. You mix uh, rag with jazz and get something else. I'm not good enough at music to know 
the actual story, but it's very clear that you can see descent with modification. You can see the family trees of, of musical styles. Gods evolve. Gods used to be vengeful, petty tyrants obsessed with their um, irritations with each other and with us. Uh, they're now disembodied monotheistic spirits that, who, of, of benevolence, which is a good thing. They, they, they've improved over the years. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it's a bit cheeky to say gods evolve, but it, it, it's very clear from history that they have. Governments evolve. And it's very clear from the history of government that it starts out as a protection racket. It starts out as a monopoly on violence. I've got all the weapons, so I'm going to make the society peaceful. Uh, and by the way, you can see this happening, for example, in the story of prison gangs today. You can see governance emerging within prisons in terms of monopoly, monopolies on violence sort of appearing spontaneously without anybody um, uh, planning them to. But, uh, but that isn't the final story of government, obviously, because government is more than just a monopoly on violence. It then evolves into something much more uh, benevolent and much more uh, paternalistic and much more all-embracing. All it evolves to a welfare state. Cities evolve in the most fascinating way. Cities have tremendous predictability about them uh, in terms of as they get bigger, it's predictable at what, at, what, at what speed the number of restaurants will increase or the number of petrol stations will increase or something. There are these laws that, that define how cities, how cities grow. Uh, Jeffrey West at the Santa Fe Institute has chronicled all this. Um, they don't grow proportionately, they grow disproportionately, these different, different measures, etc. Um, but it happens in all cities. There's a sort of evolutionary law about how cities evolve. The law evolves itself. Uh, common law, of course, particularly, is designed to be evolutionary. It's designed to learn from precedent, to build upon what went before, to, to pull its ideas out from ordinary customs uh, and m embody those in laws and then uh, change it, uh, be, be flexible enough to change as time goes on. These things are all, well, what are they? How, wh what word could we use to describe these things that are the product of human action but not the product of human design? That's a phrase from a Scottish philosopher in the 18th century called Adams Ferguson, uh, who was a um, retired army chaplain, uh, and he came up with this phrase. He said, there are lots of things that are the product of human action, but not the product of human design. And we still don't really have a vocabulary for these things. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, the rain that is falling outside uh, is, the result, is neither the result of human action nor the result of human design. Uh, the car that I drove through the rain in is the result of both design and action. But what about the English language? The English language is a wonderful example of an evolutionary phenomenon. It's something that nobody designed, nobody's in charge of, thank goodness. There is no central committee of the English language, um, and long may that remain so. Um, and yet, it's obvious when you think, and yet it's, ma it's man-made. You know, it's not, a, uh, it's not a natural phenomenon like a rainstorm. Uh, it's got structure, it's got order, it's got rules, uh, but nobody does def define those rules. Nobody set those rules out in advance. They emerged from the way we speak amongst each other. And one of the things I do in the book is explore some of these linguistic rules. We have, we have rules like, for example, if you use a word a lot, you shorten it. You abbreviate words if they're going to be used a lot, and you can't change the meanings of short words. So the word the or we or it hasn't changed its meaning much, whereas long words like prevaricate can change its meaning. It used to mean lie, it now means delay, uh, and so on. You know, so there are all sorts of regularities, complex functional regularities about language that emerged. And nobody, although they're man-made, it's not man-made in any design sense. It wasn't, the, you know, it's ridiculous to say there's some clever person who came up with, with some of the rules of grammar and spread it to the rest of us. It just, it was ordinary people who invented the English language. And by the way, uh, language, of course, has fossils in it to show that it's an evolutionary system, the misspelling of words in English uh, with the U in favour or, or the K in knife or whatever, uh, good examples of that. Now, I'm not claiming to have invented this idea. Lots of people have talked about the evolution of, of human society. Uh, and in fact, I, one of the, the sort of hero who re recurs throughout my book uh, is a, lived a very long time ago. His name was Lucretius. He was a uh, Roman poet uh, living about the same time as Caesar and, and Cicero. 
uh, and, um, uh, and I've kind of only really just come to realize what a hero he was. He, was, he, he wrote one poem, um, and he died in the middle of it, so um, we uh, don't have much more to go by. But it's a very long poem. It's called De Rerum Natura, On the Nature of Things. Uh, and it is unbelievably radical and modern and materialist and uh, disrespectful and, uh, in other ways, rather extraordinary. I mean, he argues that the world consists of nothing but atoms and voids. That is to say, each of us is just made of little, dot, little blobs and spaces between them. It, it doesn't matter what you are, whether you're a table or a person or the sun or whatever, everything is made of atoms and voids. It's a it's an unbelievably modern idea. Uh, he got it from Democritus, and it turns out to be right. He had no reason to know that it was right. In other words, there's no special spirits. There's no special essences. There's nothing different about living things than non-living things. Uh, he argues that religions are superstitious delusions, that there is no afterlife, there are no angels, demons, or ghosts, uh, there was no golden age, uh, that life is a battle for survival, uh, that, human, that the world was not created for man, uh, at all, there's nothing special about us, and he argues that nature ceaselessly experiments and those creatures that adapt and reproduce will survive. He gets very, very close to the Darwinian insight uh, in uh, roughly 50 BC. Um, as you can imagine, he wasn't popular when the Christians came along, and he got suppressed, and every copy of De Rerum Natura was rooted out and burned, uh, and it wasn't, and as far as everyone knew, it, it, although there were references to the poem, uh, it had been lost until 1417 when, when a copy was discovered uh, in a German monastery by a papal secretary who um, copied it out and it came into wide circulation again and it had an enormous influence on the Renaissance and on the Enlightenment. So Galileo was obsessed with it, uh, Spinoza was influenced by it, Voltaire was a huge fan of it, uh, and Thomas Jefferson had five copies in five different translations of it in his library. Um, so the idea's been floating around, but of course I, don't want, I shouldn't make Lucretius into a great man any more than anyone else because that would contradict my theory. Um, so uh, let's just say the idea emerged and evolved and was, was picked up by, by other people. And the person who picks it up best and first, I think, is Adam Smith. Uh, who writes a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments in 1759, exactly a century before The Origin of Species. And uh, in The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is a very difficult book, a very um, uh, complicated book to read, uh, he makes a really rather radical and modern point, which is that morality is something that we work out among ourselves. It's not something that we... Uh, that we wouldn't be immoral if we didn't have people to tell us to be moral. Um, we work out morality by deciding what is acceptable in society as we grow up. We, we try behaviours, and if they don't work out well, we, we realise that they're wrong. Uh, and he says that in that sense, priests are really generally reflecting back to us what we have negotiated among ourselves as society, in a way, um, to, 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 to come up with, with moral codes. And, of course, Adam Smith then goes on to to write another book, The Wealth of Nations, in which he makes much the same argument uh, about the economy, that the economy is not run by the government. It is, it is something that emerges among the, intera the commercial interactions of, of different people. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, uh, therefore, it, the, the, the task, say, of, of um, feeding a city um, is not achieved by someone being in charge of feeding the city, but is, in, is achieved by the market, is achieved by the signals of price and supply and demand and things like that. And he has this wonderful sentence in the book, the sovereign is completely discharged from a duty in the attempting to perform which he must always be exposed to immeasurable delusions uh, and for the proper performance of which no human wisdom or knowledge could ever be sufficient. The duty of superintending the in industry of private people and of directing it towards the employment most suitable to the interests of society. Um, so there's a sort of direct analogy here between economics and ecology, between the way a rainforest emerges with great complexity and a, and a fit for every species, and the way a market emerges with a, with a role for every merchant uh, in it. Um, 
By the way, this idea, and one or two reviewers haven't quite got this point, so it's nice to correct them, um, this idea is exactly the opposite. It's 180 degrees the opposite of social Darwinism. Social Darwinism argues that we must assist biological evolution in order to help the progress of society. And we must do that by preventing certain people from breeding and by, if necessary, killing them. And that's the idea that led to eugenics and that led to some pretty horrible uh, things happening in, in the 20th century. Um, uh, this is the opposite. This is saying to hell with biological evolution. We've got technological evolution. We've got social evolution. We can have ideas compete with each other and, and, and battle for survival and bad ideas can die so that bad people don't have to die. So that we don't have to kill anyone at all, as it were. So I, I think it's very important um, to, to understand that eugenics was an an attempt to, an uh, intelligent design, if you like. It was an attempt to take evolution as a prescription rather than as a description. Uh, whereas I'm talking about the evolution of, of ideas and, and society and technology themselves. And there is a good theory of this. You know, I'm not just spouting generalities here. There is a very well worked out theory nowadays, <coughs> developed particularly by three American academics called Rob Boyd, Pete Richardson, and Joe Henrik, um, uh, of the theory of cultural evolution and how it works and and, and what, under what conditions you will get an evolutionary system. And it turns out that some of the assumptions people, people made early on, that you would need to have discrete units of culture like you have discrete units of biology called genes, are, is wrong. You can have a very fluid system and it still works very well. As long as there is a degree of faithful replication and as long as there is trial and error, there is selection, um, then you will get evolutionary change, and it can be progressive, and it can be constructive, and it can produce complexity. Um, so back to this problem of creationism, of our tendency to, to see too much top-downery in the world. Um, Dan Dennett traces it back to what he calls the intentional stance, that uh, we tend to walk around uh, assuming that there is more uh, intention behind things that have no intention behind them. So thunderstorms are malign things that were out to punish us for um, our sins or, or whatever. And it's true that we, do see, we have a hair trigger for thinking that something was caused by um, a malign influence rather than, or, or even a benign one, rather than, than, than happened naturally. Um, uh, but it leads us, I think, into the error of looking at the world and giving credit to great men when we should actually give credit to ordinary men and women. Um, the great man theory of history is, has been argued over for centuries. Uh, uh, the Enlightenment philosophers, Diderot in particular, were so antithetical to it that when they produced their great encyclopedia, um, they decided to leave out all biographical entries altogether. There are no bi biographies in the great 18th century encyclopedia. If you want to read Isaac Newton's biography, which is in there, sorry, there are biographies in there, they're just not under the names of the people they're about. Uh, so if you want to read Isaac Newton's biography, you have to look up Woolstrop, which is the village he was born in in, 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 in Lincolnshire. Um, and they're making a deliberate point. History is made by ordinary people, not by kings and emperors and saints and things like that. And, of course, then Carlyle comes along and says the opposite. That's rubbish. Look at Napoleon. Come on, he changed history. Well, did he? Or was he, was he an epiphenomenon of the, of the French Revolution that was almost inevitable? Sure, he was different from other people, etc. And you might think after the 20th century with Hitler and everyone else that, that we've had some pretty good examples of great men, albeit bad men. And, by the way, Lord Acton said great men are usually bad men, which is quite a good, um, good point. Uh, not always, but usually. Um, but when you look at the dictators of the early 20th century, you find that actually there's a kind of inevitability about this. When radio comes along as a perfect tool for demagoguery, uh, and that the one thing that the dictators really latch onto is the use of radio to, to, to spread their ideas, um, there's a sort of inevitability about some, about some dictators emerging around that time. But of course, they would have been different ones. Where this becomes most obvious, I think, is in the case of invention and discovery. Um, uh, if Google had not been founded, would we have no search engines? Of course not. There were 20 or 30 different search engines already on the market when Google came along. 
So if Sergey Brin and, and Larry Page had fallen under a bus, would, would the world have been different? Well, we wouldn't call it Google, certainly, but we would still have a verb for to search for things on, on the web, uh, as it were. The search engine, I think, is one of the great inventions of my lifetime. It would inevitably have happened. Um, Thomas Edison discovered the light bulb. Um, or did he? No, we come from Newcastle. We know that Joseph Swan discovered the light bulb. Uh, and we're not wrong, he did. But then if you live in Russia, Lodigin discovered the light bulb. Actually, there are 23 different people with good claims to have discovered the incandescent light bulb in the 1870s independently. And what's that telling us? It's telling us that there was something inevitable, inexorable, about discovering light bulbs in that decade. Technology had reached the point where the combination of different technologies to produce a light bulb was going to produce the incandescent light bulb in that decade. Uh, and it would have chosen its inventor rather than the other way around. Um, and of course, this is true of scientific discovery too. Charles Darwin famously uh, published the theory of uh, natural selection because he was about to be scooped by Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, the discovery of the planet Neptune by Adams and Le Verrier, the French rival in the same year, uh, almost led to uh, war between France and Britain. Everyone was so cross about the other taking the credit. Uh, Newton and Leibniz with the calculus. Even Einstein. Um, Einstein might seem to be a case of unique discovery of something that absolutely nobody else was on the track of, but that's not true. If you examine the history books, it's very clear that Hendrik Lorentz would have discovered special relativity pretty quickly if Einstein had fallen under a tram. Kevin Kelly, uh, in his book, What Technology Wants, uh, documents the fact that we know of six different inventors of the thermometer, three of the hypodermic needle, four of vaccination, four of decimal fractions, five of the electric telegraph, four of photography, three of logarithms, five of the steamboat, six of the electric railroad. So every inventor and discoverer is dispensable in the sense that if he hadn't been there, somebody else would have got there. It might have taken a little bit longer, might have come together in a different form, etc. Uh, and, and what that's telling us is that, it, it, I mean, it, it, this is, it, I've got to be careful here because I don't want to be rude about great scientists. You know, they do a wonderful job and great, great inventors and, and more power to them and they're, they're the people I admire most in the world. Um, uh, but, but there really is an evolutionary process here and the, 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 the habit of giving one of them a Nobel Prize and not giving the others who would have discovered it or put the previous link in the chain to the discovery is terribly invidious and nearly every Nobel Prize leaves behind it a chain of really furious people um, <laughs> who have good reason to be really furious uh, because they deserve it almost as much and patents patents the same patents tend to exaggerate the extent to which we give credit to, to people so I'm not saying that scientists inventors don't matter but I am singing a little bit of a praise to ordinary people uh, and to challenge the linear model that, that, it, that it comes down, that in discovery and invention comes down from above. And the really great obvious example of this today is the internet. <coughs> a system that has nobody in charge of it, wasn't invented in any deliberate sense by anyone. There's all sorts of people keep trying to give credit for the internet to, um, you know, Tim Berners-Lee or, 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 or um, I uh, can't remember the guy who invented packet switching, etc. But it's nonsense, actually. It was a peer-to-peer -peer, um, thing among ordinary people beginning to work out how to get their computers to communicate with each other um, uh, that produced the internet. And it's still emerging and evolving, and it's still changing all the time. And although we're trying constantly to put people in charge of it and to censor it, we're not succeeding. And where is it going next? Because it certainly hasn't finished evolving. Um, I don't know, and I'm, I'm usually wrong when I talk about the future, um, but I do think that it's possible uh, that one technology in particular looks very intriguing as to what's going to happen next, and that's the blockchain technology, which is the technology behind Bitcoin, which is a public ledger that allows you to essentially build trust in... Uh, in um, I'm going to have to wave my hands a bit here because I don't really you know, um, <laughs> understand it, I have to admit. Um, but it's, it's a public ledger that allows you to build trust in, in, in money, in particular in the case of Bitcoin, but also in other things. So there's the idea of smart contracts where you don't need a lawyer, sorry, lawyers, uh, you don't need an accountant, sorry, accountants, etc., because there is sort of trust built into the, to this public ledger. 
Um, and the marvelous thing about blockchain is that we kind of, it, it, the, the person who invented it, we know his name, but it's a pseudonym. He's called Satoshi Nakamoto. He uses a, a German web address, British English, uh, East Coast hours, and a Japanese name. So can you work out from that where he lives? California. Yes. <laughs> um, he's almost certainly Nick Zabo, although I've challenged Nick Zabo with this, and he hotly denies it. Um, and until last week, there was no picture of Nick Zabo on the internet, but he gave a talk in London last week, so you can actually see a video of him. He does exist. I tried to get in touch. I was, unfortunately, I was out of the country when he was there. But um, I think it's rather wonderful. that, And the reason he keeps his anonymity secret, Satoshi Nakamoto, is because governments don't like rival currencies. Um, and there is a bad history of what happens to people who set up rival currencies. And, and Bitcoin already has all sorts of um, slightly shocking things associated with this, like used use by drug dealers, etc. But I think it's rather a wonderful concept that, that we could see an incredibly important technology beginning to emerge through the internet that will be a big part of our lives in the future, and we don't know who invented it. Um, because in the end, Satoshi Nakamoto is just one of, one of he, he was part of a group of people called the, um, uh, what were they called, cypherpunks, a meeting in, uh, Nick Zabo was, was one of these people. And so the cypherpunks generally deserve the, 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 the credit for this. Um, uh, and talking of that, I'll just end by uh, making the point that what on earth is a member of the House of Lords standing here telling you that elites don't matter and ordinary people do? Um, and it's a fair cop, I think, is the, is the first answer. But the second answer is, actually, the House of Lords is very powerless and and uh, you can stand up for bottom ideas in uh, for bottom up ideas in the House of Lords too. Not that many of us do. Uh, and one of my colleagues the other day told a story about how generally the average age in the House of Lords is quite old, as you may have noticed. And um, how one one of us had uh, um, decided he was too old to engage with social media. It's too complicated going online, and. Uh, you know, understanding computers and so on. But he realized it's important, and you've got to stay with the program, and you've got to keep up to date. So he was going to do, in everyday life, what people do on social media. So he goes up to people in the street, and he shows them pictures of his cats <laughs> and his wife, uh, and he tells them what he had for breakfast, <laughs> and he tells them he likes them, um, and, uh, uh, and it's working. He's got followers. <laughs> two social workers and a policeman. <laughs> Thank you very much. be some institutions that are designed and don't evolve in that sort of bottom-up basis. I mean, I think it's something like international air traffic control. I mean, <laughs> how could that be done on that basis? It must, in fact, have been sensibly planned, and it's not just there for ordinary people to alter whenever they feel like it. Yes, but even there, I could probably make a case that there were that you have to have competing designs of air traffic control around the world, some of which discover best practice and others of which then copy it. Um, uh, if, if, that if, if we all had one, one totally, uh, only one way of doing air traffic control, it wouldn't be able to change. It wouldn't be able to improve in this, to the same degree. I don't know whether that's actually true or not, whether the air traffic control does vary from place to place. And well, if it just, doesn't, perhaps that's why it's so old-fashioned. Well, you know. one just hopes that, that all of the different ones in different places somehow... Indeed. Uh, Hand over to each other, I think, right. is the phrase. <laughs> yes. Interact neatly. Anyway, um, yes. questions. Uh, there should be a roving mic. Is there a roving mic? There is. Very good. Any questions anyone wants to put to mic? Well, you can't be that stunned. That's <laughs> yes, Matt, Matt, you made a... It's, it's, yeah, hi, Matt. Um, you made a point about about bad people and about about people who uh, who um, like the Hitlers or or uh, in the world. And you made a point that they were a product of their system. 
What does that tell us about modern history and about modern interventions into parts of the world who are going through that evolutionary process? It, does it say, does your theory allow us to say, well, look, actually, we shouldn't intervene because that's a natural process? Or is your theory saying, well, like, actually, if we give them a nudge, that's part of evolution? Yeah, that's a really good point. Because if, if, say, going through a tyrannical demagoguery is a natural evolution of society, uh, as a lot of the Arab world has recently done, are we wrong to try and prevent it? Or are we right to say, to step in and say, let's try and help you short circuit that phase of, of, of history? Uh, and I think, I don't think, you know, one needs to get hang, hung up on sort of recapitulation theories here where, you know, everybody has to go through the same path because uh, countries are now emerging into democracy in a world of the internet rather than the radio. And the wonderful thing about the internet is that it is a many-to-many -many system, not a one-to-many system. Uh, and that makes it very much harder to be a demagogic uh, populist, um, I think. So, so in that sense, uh, well, that's, that's one reason I'm optimistic. The other reason I'm optimistic is because we can... Remember, this is an evolutionary system in the sense that um, new ways of doing things are, uh, 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 appear through recombination. But then they have to be selected. And the selection is non-random. And we can select. We can say we like this way of doing it, but we don't like this way of doing it. And we can go to a country that's on the brink of falling into tyranny and saying, look... You really don't have to do this. You know, you can go a different way. So now you may say that's top-down top down interference in a bottom-up system, and it probably is. And that's where, again, like Alistair's example, I have to admit there are limits to, to my idea. But I'm not trying to get everyone to say you can't ever do anything in a top-down way. I'm just saying let's try and appreciate the degree to which the world does actually is much more bottom-up than we think. Thank you. Um, so you know, this central claim about the importance of bottom-up processes, um, I, I, I suppose I want to ask, to what extent is this just a descriptive claim? Or do you want to go further, and I get little hints that you might want to go further and make it a normative claim, that this is how we should be doing things? So, so w which is it? Maybe a bit of both. A bit of both. Um, I, I mean, it's mostly a, a, an attempt to sort of understand and describe the world. But it, I do think that uh, the... Um, the, 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 the itch to, 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 to step into a system and try to solve it from a top-down way is too strong and needs to be resisted. And that occasionally we need to step back and say, look, people are coming up with a solution to that themselves. I'll give you one example of, of a, of a um, uh, problem I'm getting quite involved with in, in Parliament and in the newspapers at the moment, and that is the emergence of electronic cigarettes. Now, um, they came out of China about 10 years ago um, through the recombination of a couple of technologies. Uh, um, uh, vaping is catching on in some countries much more than in others. It's sort of evolving. It's getting better. It's getting more uh, sophisticated. It's driving out smoking at quite a rate. That's causing a reaction from the tobacco companies and from the pharmaceutical industry, which has got rival uh, products. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, governments, really through the European Commission, leapt in and said, we need to stop this, the evolution of this thing, because it's going to be a gateway into smoking. It's now clear that it's a motorway out of smoking. So far from um, uh, stopping it, they should be encouraging it. But meanwhile, we've passed something called the Tobacco Products Directive, which comes into force next May, which is going to be a real problem for the three and a half million people in this country who are vaping, because they're not going to be able to get hold of the products they like, and they'll probably a lot of them will go back to smoking. So it's going to be incredibly counterproductive. Uh, and um, how you stop this juggernaut of the Tobacco Products Directive is something we're putting our minds to in, in, in Parliament. So for, I'll just give you an example of, of the incredibly counterproductive nature of this, this directive. It, it, it says that every manufacturer of a, uh, a vaping product must produce um, uh, a list of every chemical, hundreds of chemicals, that are in this product and their toxicology data. Cigarettes don't have to obey that rule. <laughs> they have about 10 times as many chemicals in them and they only have to list the toxicology data on three, on, on tar, nicotine and... Uh, what's the other one? I can't remember. Anyway. Yes. 
Uh, yes, Mark, I thought your thesis very compelling, but I do rather sense behind it uh, a relentless, almost Panglossian optimism. Uh, all is for the best, in the best of all possible worlds. And isn't it just as possible that human interaction drives destruction and perhaps the end of the world as opposed to some wonderful future? Yeah, and um, Bill, I, I'm going to say uh, no in two ways. One is that I'm the opposite of Pangloss, because Pangloss, remember, said this world is perfect. And when, Va when Voltaire coined the word optimist, it was to mean someone who thought the world's perfect. He was mocking Leibniz for his view that, that through theodicy that since God created the world, the world must be perfect. So therefore, if 70,000 people have died in, a, in an earthquake in Lisbon, they must have been very naughty people. That was, the, that was the argument. And Pangloss goes around saying, this is the best of all possible worlds, and therefore, whatever happened must be good, and if, you know, if I get sold into slavery, that must be good. Uh, you know, and it's, it's very funny, the book, in that sense. Um, I'm the opposite of that. I'm saying this world is a veil of tears compared to what it's going to be next. Uh, I'm saying that you know, we haven't by any means got to a perfect world. We're, we're, we're able to improve it. So, so Pangloss is a pessimist compared with me, okay, <laughs> in that sense. But the other point, that surely bad things can evolve as well as good, yes, but not so easily. Because we, good things can evolve in an open system, bad things have to evolve in, clo in a closed system. I'll give you an example. Computer viruses, uh, they can share ideas, the people designing computer viruses, but only in secret whereas we can share solutions to computer viruses in public. Uh, and, uh, you know, after all, remember, we are the selectors. And if someone comes up with a really bad idea, we can reject it. So that's why the world is improving, because out of the evolutionary possibilities presented to us, we pick the ones we like and reject the ones we don't like as people. And so, so that's where the bias comes in, uh, is that in this case it's not natural selection, it's human selection. Um, I'm just curious mostly about the fact that sometimes we select the bad ideas and like in quite all-encompassing ways. So I study a lot of antibiotic resistance and in this case sort of how do you describe it what, and how do you tackle it on this approach? Sort of you end up in a case where it was a great idea when it started and now we've found ourselves at a dead end in a way and almost no way out of it. Um, well, I think there is a way out of it. I mean, I think we, you know, I, I suspect we will be able to solve antibiotic resistance if we put, if we put our innovatory hats on and, 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 and try to tackle it. Um, uh, and antibiotic resistance is a beautiful example of an evolutionary system. We thought we'd invented penicillin and solved the problem, but the bacteria didn't accept that judgment and decided that they would do some evolving um, to get around the problem. And so that means we've got to do some evolving to get around them. We're in an arms race with them. We just didn't realize that for a long time. But the solution is going to come from e evolution. I mean, the solution is going to come from evolving our responses to whether through different practices in hospitals or through uh, different uh, recombinations of chemicals or different approaches generally. We're going to have to, as it were, evolve alongside the bacteria, and we'll be in an arms race probably indefinitely, but there's no reason we can't st stay one step ahead. And I think we're now putting the sort of resources we need into solving that problem, and we will see results. There are already some, some quite exciting possibilities there. So I wouldn't be as pessimistic as you that we're in a sort of tremendous crisis because of it, but yes, we are in a, a crisis. I was with you, Matt, all of the way until you came to the bit where you said that you, about uh, the public having a greater force on by choosing good over things which are bad. And I find that quite hard to believe because you only have to look around and see what fast food is available. You only have to look and see which are the most popular newspapers. Uh, pretty much any time the public is asked to exercise its choice, it doesn't exercise it wisely. Yeah, but will you be able to exercise it any more wisely? Um, do, we, do we really have such a great track record of telling the ordinary people what they should want as opposed to what they do want? I, I'm not convinced there's, there's a great, uh, there's a great wi wisdom. I mean, in a sense, this is, 
This is the argument that the clever people should be in charge rather than... Uh, and, uh, and, and sure, Donald Trump is a nice example of... <laughs> you know, um, well, you, you get my point. Uh, <laughs> I don't need to finish the sentence. Um, uh, but, but in the end, I just, I, I just think that, you know, uh, we've, we've had some horrible examples of people trying to tell us what to do from above and getting it wrong. Let me give you an example, the, the one child policy um, um, uh, in China, uh, which th there, th there are two ways basically to, to, to solve an overpopulation, uh, high population growth in the world we now know. One is an evolutionary way called the demographic transition in which you, as people get richer and their babies stop dying, they, they actually voluntarily have smaller families and as long as there's contraception and advice and female education available then that will happen. And that's the way most countries have gone and that's the way African countries are going at the moment at a rate of knots. And the other way is uh, to say, hang on, we've got a problem, we're going to come in and we're going to tell everybody that they can only have two, one child and we're going to um, uh, punish you dreadfully and we're going to actually fine your, your village if, if somebody goes off and as a child in secret and we're going to force you to have abortions up to the eighth month of pregnancy and things like that, which is what the one child policy uh, encompassed. And it produced roughly the same result, but with a huge amount more suffering along the way. Um, so that's an example of where I think letting people choose is not such a bad idea. Um, and I, I think you, you, you've got to just be a little bit more relaxed, Noel, about the, um, the choices of ordinary people. <laughs> I'm doing fine. Up to you. Global warming. <laughs> Possibly a product of social and technological evolution. How will we evolve to deal with it? It's interesting. I think the cause, of, if it is the cause, is bottom up. And we're all responsible. It's collective. Yeah. But we're getting a very big top down view at the moment. And I wondered what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Well. I'm personally mildly encouraged by what's happening in Paris because it, I think we're seeing the end of this ridiculous uh, circus of attempts to solve it in a top-down way by political negotiation. Uh, that is to say, you know, we've given up on the idea of binding targets enforced on each country because they're just never going to be acceptable to places like India which want economic growth. Um, uh, and uh, so actually all we're going to agree is um, voluntary targets out of this process, which is kind of meaningless, which is fine, and it's a way to climb off that hook. Instead of which, you're starting to hear people like Bill Gates and indeed Obama and others say, what we really need is more R&D to come up with new technologies that will solve this problem. And we don't know what those technologies are. They're, I think, personally, they're bound to be in the nuclear area, i.e. cheaper and better and safer forms of nuclear um, uh, technology, possibly including fusion, etc., etc. But I think we, we can, um, we can uh, emerge a, 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 a technological solution to this problem. I don't think we're ever going to solve it with politics. I think we'll solve it with technology. That's not quite a bottom-up approach, admittedly, because I'm talking about pouring money into R&D in a top-down top way. But I think it's more bottom-up than trying to force uh, binding uh, emissions targets on countries, which is not going to happen. We've got, in our house, we've got a phrase which is, no situation is so bad that government intervention won't make it worse. <laughs> they, um, your definition of good and bad in outcome, is something which is the outcome, by definition, the good outcome, irrespective of what it is, and that which is not preceded with the bad outcome? Or can you say, this is good and that is bad in independence of the outcome? That's a really good question, Ian, and I, I suspect that you, you need... Is there a philosopher in the room? We, <laughs> we need a philosopher. Because I, I think, yeah, I mean, you're getting at the point that, that if the world chooses fast food and bad newspapers, like Noel worries, uh, then um, how can we... Wh who are we to say that's bad? If that's what people want to choose, then if, if that's what people find to be good, then that's good, as it were. I'm relatively relaxed about that. Um, and I do think, that, I mean, my definition of, what's, of, of, of the, the fact that the world has improved in the last 50 years 
is objective. You know, I do look at the world and say, um, uh, child mortality is down, longevity is up, um, incomes up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, I think I think one can be, as it were, objective about that. It's not those aren't subjective things. Well, maybe they are a bit. Even even so, yeah, maybe you've got a point there. Fascinating uh, uh, talk. Uh, could I, uh, if you'll allow me to characterize your idea as uh, a scientific one, if you'll just indulge me for a second, can, can you suggest uh, any observation that would falsify what ah. you're saying? <laughs> that's a very good question, isn't it? Because that's what Karl Popper said. If, if, it can't, if you can't find something that falsified it, uh, then, it, then it's um, uh, unscientific. Um, uh, and... Um, Hmm, let me think about that one, because um, it, it, my idea is, is sufficiently vague that it perhaps has a bit of that quality about it, uh, that, that I, could, I could excuse my way around any problem. Indeed, I've done so in the last 10 minutes for a couple of, of issues. Um, uh, and I, I suppose my answer, therefore, is that I'm not trying, this isn't a scientific hypothesis. This is just a sort of contribution to debate about how to look at the world. But there are particular scientific hypotheses buried in it. So I would, for example, predict that there will be buried fossil mistakes in most evolutionary systems, like the misspelling of the word knife, for example, or the um, uh, waste disposal pipe through the recreational area or whatever. And that therefore, uh, if I can find those in pretty well every aspect of society, which then I'm, I'm on track. Uh, and when I can't, then maybe it was perfectly designed by a brilliant designer. Um, uh, and so I suspect the air traffic control system may have fossil mistakes in it. Um, but I might be wrong. Is that a, that's not really a very good answer, sorry. But anyway, it's a start. I think at that point, um, can I just say, first of all, a big thanks to you, the audience, for coming out this evening. It's a pretty yeah. horrible night, I'm sure you all excuse. But I hope that one of the things you'll do uh, after listening to this presentation is you'll actually go into our wonderful science centre. We have a wonderful science centre with an international reputation. And you'll contribute some of your ideas so that you can be part of this bottom-up force that's actually uh, bringing about change in knowledge and all the rest of it. But uh, we'd also like you, perhaps not this evening, uh, to go on our ice rink. <laughs> <laughs> It does turn the world upside down, and I think it really gives us a lot of